So, DVFS, dynamic voltage and frequency scale, has a lot of uh, 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 fun names. A speed step, turbo boost, speed shift, cool and quiet, CPU dynamics. I was just looking from yesterday. What is the idea? Um, the power consumption of the CPU depends on uh, its clock speed. This is what is the, the static power consumption. So it depends on the calculations, but it also depends on the clock. Speed. And uh, there is actually no benefit to the user in running the CPU at its top speed if it's not doing anything. So uh, uh, in all CPUs uh, right now, mobile, desktop, server, yeah, other important example, there is what is called a governor. A governor is a piece of, of, uh, of code which looks at what the CPU is doing and is trying to reduce, reduce, reduce the voltage of the CPU and also the frequency of the CPU to make it as low as possible. The lowest possible voltage and frequency, which is enough to get the CPU to run properly. And if something, you know, if something uh, very computation intensive is coming up, uh, then I raise the voltage and I raise the frequency so the CPU gets things done faster. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there is what is called, you know, performance mode and balance mode. So balance mode or power saver mode. Power saving mode is going to use uh, the low end and it's going to be very aggressive in throttling the power consumption and lowering the frequency. And performance mode is going to be a very, you know, very aggressive in raising it. At, uh, actually, Turbo Boost, uh, what Turbo Boost is saying, um, you know, when the CPU runs faster, it also creates more heat. So what Intel is saying, if I see that only one core out of my multi-core CPU is running, I am going to raise its frequency very, very high because I can deal with the power dissipation. So this is very useful. Everybody has it made. Uh, but what happens is that there is like a two-dimensional array here, uh, two-dimensional, uh, let me just draw this using my drawing skills. So this is the voltage and this is the frequency. Uh, not all of the combinations of voltage and frequency are stable. Uh, what happens if I, if I, if I take my voltage and, and lower it too much, uh, and I also take my frequency and raise it too much, uh, what happens is that I will have um, my, my logic will be working very slowly because I lowered my voltage. And on the other hand, my uh, calculations are supposed to be finished very quickly because I raised my frequency, and I'm going to have uh, what is called a setup called violations. What I showed you in the clock glitching, I will actually have clock glitching on my device. So uh, there is a, like a safe zone of uh, regions where the CPU is supposed to live. But if I, on purpose, change the voltage frequency settings so that I'm using a frequency which is too high and the voltage which is too low, then I will start getting faults in my system. Now, the first paper which uh, this explored this was clock screw, uh, which played with raising the frequency, making the frequency too high. And, but there was a, a, a continuation of this work. And now you also have papers, the, um, the two which were published very, very uh, closely together called Volt Jockey and Thundervolt. Volt Jockey is for ARM, you know, mobile chips, IoT chips. And uh, Plundervolt is for um, Intel CPUs. So the idea is I'm going to wait until something very exciting is going to be happening in my system. And I'm going to lower my voltage periodically. And I'm going to lower it only for the core doing the secret stuff, because otherwise it will be self-destruct. I will also ruin myself. And this core is going to do a, a faulty calculation. And then I'm going to enjoy the result of this, again, whatever fault attack I'm doing. Um, so one thing I want to show you before I show you a very short video, a demo video, is uh, the attacker model. So the attacker model assumes that the attacker has root privileges. And this is because 
uh, user application cannot change the voltage and frequency value. Only a privileged application. And now the question to be asked is, if I am a privileged user, I can do whatever I want. Why should I even need this attack? I can just read out the memory. So in what situations does the attacker actually need to run? I have root. I can write, overwrite the entire kernel. OK, so hypervisor. Right, so if I'm a hypervisor, I'm running in a virtual machine. I can play with the voltage and frequency of my virtual machine. It's not going to change the voltage and frequency of the metal running below. Me. So there is one exotic or non-exotic uh, situation where uh, there are places where even the root can be accessed. And this is called uh, the secure enclave. And uh, so why are the secure enclaves? SGX is one example. Trust zone is the other example. Why do they exist? What are they used for? I really don't have time to tell you. Uh, but their main usage is for uh, copy protected movies. So uh, SGX is a piece of memory which is sealed and protected so well that even a root user cannot read from it. The root user can maybe destroy it. The root user can delete it. But the root user cannot modify it. it can't read what's going on inside can't write what's going on inside. And now, uh, so you can think of motivations of doing it. It's not my job. Um, um, but mainly, it's being used for DRM. And now I'm going to show you very, very briefly uh, a fault attack on RSA encryption, decryption running inside an SDS enclave. And it's uh, based on the Plundervolt uh, talk from uh, KS Convention. I'm going to be putting the talk in the chat. And what is really nice about this, because this is the last talk in the course that I'm giving, if you look at this uh, talk, say, given by uh, a researcher from Bristol University and a researcher from Glass University, they are saying it's, it's worth the 15 minutes to, to watch. Uh, uh, they keep saying, there is a lot of crypto here. Uh, we don't understand the crypto. But uh -huh, you guys already understand the crypto, because you are finished the course of a text and secret implementation. So I'm going to show you only five minutes from this, or maybe two or three minutes. The uh, attackers are going to attack RSA decryption inside an enclave using uh, undervolting. So they're using, a, they're going to create a transient fault, and they're going to use it to extract the key. So let me just put it on the YouTube magic cool thing. And we are going to go to second. We're going to 22 minutes in. OK. okay. I'm going to seek ahead to uh, 22. First of all, I'll show you the code that I wrote. Again, copied from the internet. Thank you. So there it is. I'm going to okay. trigger the fault. I'm going to, I'm going to wait for the trigger at fault. Then I'm going to do a decryption. And let's have a quick look at the code, which should be exactly the same as it was right at the very beginning when we started this. Yeah, there's my dead beef. It's written slightly differently, but there's my dead beef. So now this is it's so slightly messy on the screen, but I hope you're going to see this. So minus 239, fine. Um, still fine. So what, what Kit is doing here is uh, she is uh, doing RSA encryptions in a secure enclave while lowering the voltage of the core running the secure operation by 239 millivolts. And if you want to read out how she did it, you want to see how she did it, uh, you're welcome to see the first 22 minutes of this talk. I'll just pause there. You can see at the bottom I've written meh, all fine, if you're wondering. So what we're looking at here is a correct decryption. And you can see inside the enclave, I'm initializing P and I'm initializing Q. 
and those are part of the private key. I shouldn't be able to get those. So 239 isn't really working. Let's try going up to minus 240. Ooh, 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 RSA error, RSA error. Excited. Okay, so this should work for the attack then. So let's have a look. Again, I copied some uh, somebody's attack on the internet where they very kindly... Uh, the echoes are from the recording. They're in a very, very large hall in Germany. Uh, I can't help you with that. I I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this wonderful research that you're getting talked about from the authors for free has an echo. I'm really apologizing. Why don't you email them and ask for your money back? Uh, it's called the Lenstra attack. And again, I got, <laughs> I got an output. I don't know what it is because um, I didn't understand any of that crypto stuff. But let me have a look no, in the source code. We understood the crypto. See if that exists anywhere in the source code inside the enclave. It does. I found P. And if I found P, I can find Q. So just to summarize what I've done, from a bit flip, I have got the private key out of the SGX enclave. And I shouldn't be able to do that. Yes, yes. And I think I have an idea. So you didn't like oh, the previous. I know where this is going. Yes. You didn't like the previous name. So I came up with something more cute and relatable, maybe. Uh, so I thought this is an attack on RSA. So I called it Mufasa. OK. Um, yeah. Um, so one of the themes of this talk is how to find the name for, for the attack. We know now that it's called Thunderbolt, but uh, uh, yeah. Um, I'm out of time. <laughs> so I really recommend that you watch this, this entire talk. It's very, very well given. Uh, and, and you'll be in a better position to understand this attack than the authors of the paper. Isn't that awesome? Uh, not really, but you'll be in a really good shape to understand the attack. Uh,